and they make me strong. And I am grateful today on this morning. Praise him. Praise his name. Praise his name. Praise his name. All right. On the program. I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Come on, let's go. Can you? Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch. Come on, watch y'all. Come on up. Like you. Come on, hit it a little bit harder than that. Jesus went to Calvary. Jesus went to to Calvary to save like you. That's love. That's love. They hung him high. They stressed him white. They hung him high. 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 He hung his head for me. He died. That's love. That's love. But that's not how the story. Listen, please. That's not how the story is because he's coming back again. That's love. That's not how. Just do that. Love, love, love. Love, love, love. Love, love, love. Love, love, love. Love, love. love. love, love. 
love, 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 That's not how. That's not how. The story is. We could have come. We'll be back again. That's love. So why don't you hum that? Hum that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you confess the Lord, call him up. If you confess the Lord, call him up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now you do that's close enough. Keep on going. Oh, you got it, you got it. If you confess the Lord. If you confess the Lord, call him up. Oh, yeah. If you confess the Lord, call him up. If you confess the Lord, call him up. If you confess the Lord, call him up. If you believe in the Father and the Son. If you confess the Lord, if you confess the Lord, call him up. If you confess the Lord, call him up. If you confess the Lord, if you confess the Lord, call him up. If you confess the Lord, call him up. If you believe, if you believe in the power of the Son. Can't stop praising his name. I can't stop. Hallelujah, 
Brother Kevin, we, we need to do a spiritual song, so just play something and we're going to flow as you go. Just one of your songs. Play, play as you go. No, not a song. We're going we're gonna to give the Lord a spiritual song.
for you to play something. We want something that you play that we don't know. That's what we're going to offer him. So now you're on your own. I, that, I know that was just free. Now just, just, no, 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 no. Play something they don't know. We're going to give the Lord some words right now. So you just play something. We're not trying to give them any help. Okay.
gonna dance while I can Since I'm here Since I'm here I'm gonna dance I'm go Hold on, 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 hold on for one minute. Hold on, hold on. You can't dance in cement, which means you can't stand still and dance. This is not a side step. If you're going to dance, you got to move your feet. If your feet work, there's got to be some movement in a dance. You ain't hugging on somebody at night right now. If this is a dance, you got to dance. <laughs> okay? Some movement here, folks. Some movement here. Some movement. I'm going to dance while I got a chance. what's called wise counsel because we do not know what tomorrow brings this might be our last chance to dance to sing to give God glory 
Speaking of counsel, Minister Moment word is counsel. And we've heard this word before. We've talked about this word. Um, something very interesting happened. Um, we, in our reading, our 52-week reading, I've been, uh, we've been reading through, and this week, uh, we read through Chronicles, Second Chronicles. And in Second Chronicles, there's a story about the kings. It's our uh, Christian game of thrones, right? You got Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Everybody's fighting over the throne. Everybody wants to be king. And in the story, Jeroboam comes to Rehoboam and said, Hey, your father, right? I think it was Solomon, because they were part of the Davidic line. Your father was hard on us. So, why don't you ease our burden? And he was like, well, and this is a real bum. He's like, okay, give me a couple of days. I'll come back and I'll make my decision about what I'm going to do with you group of people. So he went and he sought counsel after the old guys who would be the wise team, right? And the young folks, his partners, his partners. He went to his partners, right? So um, before I finish the story, I'm going to tell you, give me an example. So I, um, I was on the golf course yesterday. I didn't think I was going to make it because I've been dealing with um, knee and hip. And, you know, I'm getting younger. So I didn't think I was going to make it. So I went out, and I was playing, right? And one of the nicknames they, give me, they gave me, my, go- my guys gave me, was Big Mike. Big Mike. Because I'm what's called a long hitter. Pastor knows what, what I'm talking about. And um, so we're up on the tee, and there's some people in the fairway, and you're not supposed to drive into the people in the fairway, right? Because if you were standing out there, you don't want a golf ball coming out the air, whacking you in the head. And that's happened to people. So they're like, Michael, don't hit the ball because you're a long hitter, and you may hit them. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to hit my my big club, the driver. I'm going to take my three wood. I shouldn't be able to get there. But I'm Big Mike. (laughs) So launched it, and it was a beautiful, sweet, I mean, it was sweet, Pastor, it was sweet, right? And I'm watching it, and they're watching it, and to my chagrin, the ball just kept going, and going, and I'm like, four, because you want to alert people, and the ball went over their heads, and landed in, unfortunately, I was in a sand trap, landed in a sand trap, Pastor knows what I'm talking about, I'm like, yeah, I was a little embarrassed, so we got to the next hole. I'm trying to wrap this up. I got, we got to the little further down, and I was up again, people in the fairway. And it, I remembered the story about the council. And I turned to them. And this was what Pastor was talking to us in leadership about this morning. And I was like, guys, you know, I was reading the story, and I was able to tell them about the story about wise council, about Rehoboam and Jeroboam, because Rehoboam decided he was going to listen to his homies. Right? And that began... The split, the splintering of the the tribes of Israel. This is when they went into two separate tribes, two and ten, twelve. And so I turned to them, and I brought back this whole conversation, this what we were reading. Pastor talked about it this morning. I was able to share with them what I was reading about wise counsel. And I was like, you know what? You guys were right, because the last time I almost killed somebody. I might have killed a squirrel, right? But I was like, okay, this time I'm going to wait and be patient counsel. When we seek counsel, I should have listened to my wife, because they're all older. I was like, okay, you know, I should have listened. But Big Mike, <laughs> why y'all laughing? Big Mike. Big Mike. Big Mike was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show y'all Big Mike. I'm going to kill somebody. So, listening to wise counsel, like, I need to listen to my pastor a little bit more, because I've got a little while here, right? We need to, I need to listen to my spouse a little bit more, like she just said. Right? But we should be listening to wise counsel, and that's what the moral of the story is. Right? We listen to wise counsel, and we forget about the homies, because the homies will tell us what we want to hear. Amen? <laughs> you, 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 you say con- confession is great. Confession is great. So, uh, so, so you all have heard about the uh, prophets called the Isley Brothers. You all heard about that? Okay. Well, you know, they have a lot of historic songs, and so we're going to take one of them now. So obviously, you know, this is like straight off the press, straight off the press. One of them was called Footsteps. I'm hearing Footsteps. That's all right.
right, you, you figure it out. See, it, it, so, so literally, all of us hear footsteps. The footsteps really means there's something behind you that you remember. And sometimes it seems like they're closer to you than they are, and they make so much noise. These steps make noise and they trigger thoughts that we have about things that have happened. And it's nowhere near us, it is behind us, but these steps keep reminding us of it. They keep reminding us of things that may not have gone the best, something we may have wanted to change. Can you relate to that? There's some things you say, if I could get the chance to do it all over again. Well, you don't get the chance to do it all over again. You get a chance to do something better. You don't get the chance to do it over. There are no makeovers. There are no, there are no makeovers. So now, so part of this is leading to what we need to talk to you about today. And we need to talk to you about what's in your hand. Uh, but in the meantime, because of our past, we don't get the chance to grasp what we have right now because these footsteps keep haunting us. They just keep haunting us. So how many of them do you have? Footsteps that you've been triggered by and it caused you to respond to your now differently than you should because of the fact that you are living in the past and walking in the presence. Living in your past, but walking in the present. A better way of saying that, living in your past and existing in your present. Just, you're just here. You're just numbed by the past that you can't enjoy the present because of all these steps. And it's a part of all of us. right moment to join in but you gotta just kind of roll in this you gotta kind of roll in this you, but you can't look like you're a dummy like you're a mannequin you gotta kind of roll with it you gotta remember music is neutral and we offer this to the lord so don't get thrown off because we said it started with the eyes of brother this is ours right now to give to the lord Try not to, but it keep on showing. Sometimes I get thrown off, but I promise that it will never happen. Go in before because I I keep hearing footsteps moving around all in my mind. I keep hearing what's there Tormenting me All of the time Tormenting me all the time Tormenting me all the time Tormenting me all the time all the time, tormenting me all the time. One day I met the Lord, and He said, You don't have to be controlled by your past anymore. Will you trust me now? I'll take all your pain, your hurt, your let down, and turn it around. I, I don't 
hear no footsteps now I turn it around Turn it around I, I don't hear no footsteps They're part of my past They're part of my past a part of my past, a part of my past. What do you hear? Footsteps, footsteps, footsteps. What are you going to do with your footsteps? Footsteps, your footsteps. What are you going to do with your footsteps? Your footstep, 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 your footstep. how it's all changed. What are you going to do with your footsteps? What are you going to do with your footsteps? Will they run you? Will they control you? Will they give you an attitude? Will they control you? With your footstep, what are you gonna do with your footstep? Will you give up to him? Will you give up to him? Will you give up to him? He's waiting on you. Will you give up to him? If you will, you say. To him, you can say that I'll give him to him. I'll give him to him. I'll give him. I'll give him to him. Now you can say, I gave him to him. I gave him. I gave him. He said, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He wants your heart so you can start doing this differently. So are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? 
if you are ready, then that means you should go on a deliverance mission to help somebody else who still is controlled by their footsteps. And if you're unwilling to do that, it's because you're controlled by your own. If you're not on a rescue mission, you need to be rescued. Now, now you know, if, if they didn't have to leave, we stay here another 45 minutes. But, they, but, 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 we, but, we, but we gotta reel it. But we gotta reel it in. If you give us 12 minutes, 12 minutes and we'll be, 12 minutes and we'll be done. There are so many times we're asking God for something. We're asking him for things and we haven't done well with what we have. We haven't done well. So he's asking, what's that that you have in your hand? And there are three examples, three examples. In Exodus chapter four, verses one through five, starting at verse one, and then we'll be going to first Kings 17. Then Moses answered, what if they don't believe me and will not obey me, but say the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? Notice this question. He heard the question that Moses asked, but then God turned around and gave him a question. He says, now, what, what do you have in your hand? Now, you have to ask yourself, what has he already given you? What has he already given you? Have you checked that out lately? Have you counted the inventory of what he has already given you instead of asking him for something else? Notice what he said. What's in your hand? And Moses says, a staff. Then he said, throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord told him, stretch out your hand and grab it by the tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff again in his hand. In other words, just, just notice this. There are some things that God has given you that you've been using the wrong way. And you thought it could only do X, but it could also do Y. You only saw it in that way. Did you know that something you've been using $5 for to purchase that got you nowhere fast, if you look properly, that $5 can go further than what you've been using it for. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. You have to look at what have you been using that with and for now. Now, notice what he said. Verse 5, he said, this will take place. So they will believe the Lord, the God of their fathers, and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then verse 6, he tells them something else. Put your hand inside your clothing. He put his hand inside, and he took it out, and his hands was diseased like snow. He had leprosy. Then he said to him, put your hand back inside. He put his hand inside, and he took it out, and it, it become just like the rest of his skin. And he said, if they will not believe you and will not respond to the evidence of the first sign, they may believe the evidence of the second one. And if they don't believe these two signs and listen to you, take some water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the Nile will become blood on the ground. Even after God said that, you got to understand when God's going to do something with you, he's going to put you in a place that's not the most comfortable so he can do something that could only be done if you trust him. Now, quickly here. So Moses said, you know what? I, I'm not a good speaker. Sometimes I stutter and I get scared of people if I stand up in front of them. I'm slow of speech. And the Lord said, who made the human mouth? Who made him mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. So all you stage fright people, all you folk who find looking for excuses, does it sound like he was making excuses? Does, do, does it sound like he was making excuses? I'm asking a question. I hope I'm not talking to myself. Does it sound like he was making excuses? Does it resemble you? 
Okay, it doesn't resemble you. Well, this is confession time. If it resembles you, raise your hand. We're not going to turn you in, but just raise your hand. If you know you've done that before, we're not going to turn you in. Just raise your hand. Not half mass. Half mass scene said, no, I didn't do anything. You know, you got to raise your hand all the way up. The excuses are killers. So he said, Moses, what's that that you have in your hand? Because you know what he really says? I can use it. He said, I can use it. You don't know what to do with it, although I gave it to you. He said, but I can use it if you will listen to me or listen to somebody. Else. You heard Michael say about counsel, our problem, we're too arbitrary. We're too, we're too selective about who we live. The truth is the truth. And some of the time we've been listening to people who we want to echo what our thoughts are. And that's why we don't hear him. We listen for echoes. Running around for a validation. Okay, back over here, back, back over here. All right, how much more time do I have? I'm on the clock, remember, how much more time do I have? You don't know, I, you don't know, I know, but that's okay, you don't know. In 1 Kings 17, verses 7 through 16, listen. Elijah, all of a sudden, the brook dried up, and there was no rain in the land. Then the Lord spoke to him and said, I need for you to go to Zarephath to Sidon and stay, and stay there. Notice he said, go there. Because I have commanded a woman who is a widow, a widow, to provide for you there. So Elijah got up and went to Zarephath, and he arrived at the city gate, and there was a widow woman gathering wood. That doesn't look too good, does it? She's out here trying to find something. And Elijah said to her, please bring me a little water in a cup and let me drink. And she went to get it. And he called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have anything baked. I only have a handful of flour in the jar and a bit of oil in the jug. A handful of flour and a bit of oil. And I'm gathering a couple of sticks in order to prepare it for myself and my son so we can eat it and die. This is our last meal. So what does she have in her hand? A little bit of flour and a drop of oil. And then, listen, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go and do as I have said. Only make me the loaf first and bring it out to me. Afterward, you can make some for yourself and for your son. Now, notice that that doesn't make any sense. For this is what the Lord God of Israel said, your flour jar will not become empty and the oil jug will not run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the surface of this land. In other words, he's saying until he says stop flowing oil, until he said flour will keep filling, it's going to continue. Although all you think you got is a little bit in your hand and a little bit in this jug. But when God speaks, he takes your little bit of flour and he takes your little bit of oil where you say, I can't pay no bills. I don't know what to do with any of this. And he said, God spoke. He said, what do you have? And he said, give it. But you notice who he gave it to. He gave it to the man of God. Oh, man, hello. Give me some money here. Give me some money here. If you want to have some more money. No, no, no. That's okay. Then we're going to do that. So she proceeded. Notice it. She proceeded to do according to him. And she had no reason to because it made no sense. That's why God operates in orthodoxy. He operates in an unorthodox fashion. Okay, back over here. The flour jar did not become empty. The oil jug did not run dry, just as he said. Just as he said. And I wonder how many of you have been counting something, trying to figure out what to do with it. It already is not enough. It already You already know it's not enough anyway. You know that it's not enough. And, th and you're holding on to something that can't take you nowhere anyway. All right, okay, we're almost there. We're almost there. All right, so there's Moses. Made every excuse possible. God said, Sh I need to show you something. I'm going to take your hand, which is yours. I'm going to take the staff that you have, and I'm going to show you something in my hand. I can use it. He said, I'm going to take this little bit of flour that you have that's not enough to make anything to begin with. And a little bit of oil, a little bit of oil and a whole lot of flour can't do very much when it comes to bacon. Even if you don't know how to cook, you know that. Even for those who are trying to cook, <laughs> back over here. 
<laughs> okay. So as Jesus, this is, <laughs> this is in Matthew chapter 14. Give us five minutes. This is Matthew chapter 14. As Jesus came to the shore, he saw a huge crowd. He felt compassion for them. He started healing the sick. Verse 15, when the evening came, the disciples said, this place is a wilderness and it's already late. Send these people home because this crowd is too large. They need to go buy some food so they can have something to eat. And Jesus said, now notice what he said. The dis disciples saw it one way. And Jesus looked at it through divine eyes. Our problem is we look at too much through natural stuff, to natural stuff. And he's, Jesus said, they don't need to go away. Give them something to eat. Now notice what he said. Verse 17. But we only have five loaves and two fish here. And this is what he said. Bring that to me. Then he told them, sit these people down so they can get ready to eat. Just sit them down. By faith, do what I said. He took the five loaves, the two fish, and he looked up to heaven and he blessed them. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. Now notice what he did. He broke it and he gave it to them. And what they were were carriers of an anointed loaf and fish. They became the carriers. So the focus was not on them. Woman of God, man of God, on their ability it was on them doing what he said. I want you to notice what they did. He put them in the mindset, go help somebody first. He said, I'm not asking you to sit down and eat. I'm asking you to serve the people. Are you hearing that? He said, take your focus off of yourself about what you do not have and look at what you have and see who can benefit from what you got. And don't you become your own beneficiary. He blessed him and he broke it and gave it to the crowd. Now notice this, verse 20. Everyone ate and was full. That include them. Then they picked up 12 baskets full of leftover pieces. Which meant they had doggy bed and over they had took it home. They had something else to take. Now those who ate, there were, there were now notice this. It wasn't feeding 5,000. It literally would have been over 15, close to 20. The reason is 5,000 men, then it said the women and the children, the average household had two or three children. So that meant then each one would have been four or five. So add the 5,000 men, then add four others to them, and then now you have some sense of what two fish and five of blessed bread and fish will do. Will do. So here's the story. What's in your hand? Do you know, I don't, I don't remember the last time I ran out of money, even when I didn't have any money. I, I just don't even remember. Even when I looked and thought I didn't have something, I had something. Amen. E even, even when I didn't know there was enough, it was more than enough. Because, do you know, anybody who's been around me knows I'll pay for everything all of the time and say, how can I bless you? Because that's going up to heaven so that a heavenly deposit will always come when I need it. So here's the deal. I really don't need anybody else's money unless God told them. Here it is. Unless God told them and he tells who he wants to tell so that whatever I get is blessed beyond the number that it is are you hearing it it's blessed beyond the number so fifty dollars is not really fifty dollars fifty blessed dollars is not really fifty dollars or should I say fifty kingdom dollars is not fifty worldly dollars that's why all of a sudden you'll look and it's like, oh, I still got something. Sometimes I put on some stuff and I look in the pocket and there's money in it. And I know for sure Gwen didn't put it in because she would have taken it had she seen it first. <laughs> she just confirmed that, right? She, <laughs> she would have taken it. <laughs> 
You've had enough already. You had enough. I have to ask you, what do you have in your hand and what are you going to do with it? You can try to run it and handle it if you want to. It'll only go as far as you can think. Only go as far as you can think. But if you join the kingdom economy, the kingdom economy, not only will he give you financial resources, he will give you health at a value that dollars can't pay for. That dollars can't pay for. You know, the dollars, the dollars, dollars can't pay for. Listen, I promise you, uh, I am blessed physically because of what I do. And do, when I say that, it's because all I'm doing is trying to help somebody. And so God knows the only way I can keep doing it, he's got to keep me healthy. Or I can't do the ministry that he's called me to. Because if, if I was toxic around these toxic folk, I'd be done. If I was unhealthy around unhealthy folk, I would be done. If I was unhealthy around some emotionally, ooh, all kind of folk, hey, I would be done. So he keeps me sane yes. around insanity. Are you following me? He keeps me uninfected around the affected. All right. Now, since I don't have to go anywhere, but since they do, you all need to tell them to give them a rough round of applause as they exit. You all need to give them a rough round. Now, that's pitiful. Get up on your feet and do something. That's better than that. Better than that. Do better than that. Better than keep on. Got to keep on until you can't see them anymore. Hey, Brother Kent, you know something? Rita got to do it now. If she don't ever do it nowhere else, she got to do it right along with everybody else. Uh, Natasha, why don't you come up for a minute? Since you're here, there's something you can say, and thank you for coming. So I'm going to give you the chance to, and although this is the last thing she was looking for, but, but it's okay. It's, it's okay. I would just like to say uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. It is a pleasure. It is a blessing to be here and to uh, be in your presence. And I enjoyed the praise and worship because I'm all like, that's my song. If you confess the Lord, call him up. Uh, I, I sing that quite often. I love Jesse Dixon, too. I know what prayer can do. I found the answer in prayer. I tell it everywhere. I can't sing. I can't sing. Uh-uh. Albertina Walker. Uh-uh. I know, you know, I love her too as well. She said, I can call him when I need him. Father, Father up in heaven, I can go to God in prayer. So my word to you today would be to go to God in prayer. Since we on the prayer train, let's keep on going with it. All your answers are found in the word of God, but your communication with him, which is prayer, develop your relationship with him, grow strong with him. I don't care what situation you're in, you can call him up. Jesus on the main line, call him up. All these songs deal with the telephone. They deal with prayer. He's always there 24-7, 365. The line is never closed. The door is never locked. He's always there for you. And so whenever you are lonely, whenever you are sick, whenever you are disgusted, whenever you're mad at folk, just get down on your knees and pray. Dr. Petty has been working me with that because sometimes you get angry and you get frustrated. It's like, I want the answer now. I want the trial to be over now. I want the victory now. I want the triumph now. And God's like, uh-uh, you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to wait. And you're going to have to stand and see my salvation. And it's all like, I don't want to stand to see the salvation. I want it now. And so he was all like, you have it now. You just have to wait for the manifestation and walk in it. So all I have to say to you is pray, pray, pray. Amen. So, so, uh, so, so, so now, so you're going to say to them what you really want to say? 
That was your introduction. So, what did you really want to say to them? Oh my gosh! <laughs> so, after you pray, you do have to do your part. We always want God to do his part, but then, like he even kind of said, we have the answer in our hand, and we don't really recognize it. We don't want to use it. I don't want to do my part. I want him to do everything. You do have to do your part. You're going to have to quit smoking. You're going to have to eat right. You're going to have to quit gossiping. You're going to have to go out and go to the gym. You're going to have to walk. You're going to have to lose weight. You're going to have to walk it out. You're going to have to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. And so a lot of times, we just want God to take care of everything. And it's all like, no. I've given you the power and the ability to do it as well. You're going to have to speak to that mountain. You're going to have to get up and praise me. And you're going to have to fast. I know a lot of people don't want to push the plate back, but you're going to have to fast. Me and my niece just came off of a fast. And you have to do that in this day and age and this time. You know, it's like I want to hear clearly from God about my business. I want to hear clearly from God about my children and what's going on with me. You're going to have to fast to hear clearly from him. So that's your responsibility. You have to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. He's not going to do it all for you. You have to do your part. You have to participate. Everybody say participate. participate. Say cooperate. cooperate. Say I have to do it. So I have to do what he tells me to do. I have to budget. I just can't spend money willy-nilly like I want to. And think he just going to come along and just kind of make up for it. Budget is a dirty word. Fasting is a dirty word. I know. I don't like doing it either. But you have to do it. You have to budget. And women, we have to submit. I'm married. I don't like doing it either. But you do. You have to submit. And when you honor him by submitting, it will cover you and he will keep you. If you're on a job, men, you have to submit to your boss, even if she's a female or a male. You men, you got to submit too. I know they don't like to hear it. You know, you know better than your boss, but you do. You have to submit. The Bible says submitting one to another. So that's an action, an action you actually have to do. You do have to submit. So we have to submit to our husbands. We have to submit to those who are in authority over us. Children who are in here, you have to submit to your parents. If, even if you're in here older, you have to submit to your parents. Amen. So you just have to do the things that God tells you and trust him. That's where the faith comes in, that he will do what you, he called you to do and that he will be faithful in doing it. When you submit to him, and that's the main person you need to submit to is him, and then he'll be faithful to do what he said he will do. When he sees you doing what you're supposed to do, he'll cause that other person to get in line. And it's hard to remember that because you see the person cutting up. You see your husband, it's like, you know the word. How come you're not doing the word? And it's just all like, and he's saying the same thing to you. She knows the word. How come she's not cooking? How come she's not cleaning? How come she's not doing what I tell her to do? How come she's not doing this? How come she's not, you know, submitting in the bedroom? All of it. But you have to do what God tells you to do. And then he'll start to work on that person. And the main person he's going to work on is you. The main person he's going to work on is you. I found that out. It's just all like, well, God, what about that person? He said, I want to deal with you and that unforgiveness. I want to deal with you and that stubbornness. I want to deal with you and that rebellion. And so then once he begins to deal with that, then all the other things begin to open up. And a lot of times you will see it's really not that person. It's been you all along. And then in closing, I think I'm closing. Okay, that, that was, that was your second closing. Oh, They're typically gosh. a three. So what else <laughs> do you want to say? I'm going to say this. A lot of times you have to be careful whose lenses you're looking through. Or am, I, am I looking through Satan's lenses or am I looking through God's lenses? You know when you go to the eye doctor and you see the chart and they'll put those little things up there to see where your vision is. You have to make sure you're not looking at Satan's vision, his lenses. You got to be looking at God's lenses. Satan's lenses say, I want to get revenge. I ain't. Satan's lens says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to follow what they say. I'm not going to do that. Absolutely not. God says, you're going to be meek. You're going to be humble. You're going to go to that person and forgive them. You're going to tell the person you're sorry, but God, I didn't cause the problem. I still want you to go to them and tell them that you're sorry. You're going to be the peacemaker. You're going to put on the whole armor. You're going to do the things that I tell you to do. And it's not easy to do. I'm here to tell you it is not easy, but you have to do it. He's given you the ability, the power to do it. He hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. So parents in here, tell your children right. Tell them to pay their bills. Tell them that you go get up and get out and go get a job. Quit sitting up in my basement eating my food. Put on your clothes and get out and go get a job. Don't mom sitting up here babying these kids and stuff like that. Don't enable your kids. Make them be grown men and grown women. Pay your bills. Take care of your kids. Well, mom, don't you want to take care of your grandbaby? That's not my baby. That's yours. You take care of your kids. I did not have them. You had your own kids. Take care of your kids. And women, when your spouses tell you, hey, we need to back off and let him be a man. Ladies, listen to your husband and let him be a man. 
We don't want to do that. We want to baby him, but it's like, uh-uh. The man knows. If you notice in the story of the prodigal son, the daddy did not go after the son. He knew he was out there. The wife could have been saying, don't you want to go see about him? He said, mm, he'll figure it out. And what did he say? Thank the Lord you made it back and didn't nothing happen to you. But, you know, you want to run after him, but you can't run after him. You got to let him grow up. You got to let him be who God called him to be. Amen? All right. All right. <laughs> That's my message for today. See, 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 you see, you see, you see, that's that same person who had nothing to say, remember? <laughs> and so, so what happens is there, there is a burden on you when you've been poured into that God's going to hold you accountable and you can't pretend that you had a hearing problem. Because he said, I know you heard it. And now I'm going to hold you accountable for what you heard. James 4.17 said, the one who knoweth to do good and doeth it not to that person, it is sin. And there is a consequence all of the time. So I would not want to be you if I sit on what's been poured in me. Because God's going to deal with you. See, what's, what has happened, the, the work has been done. The pouring has been done. So we got to ask you, what's that you have in your hand? Now, your hands are more full than they were before you came. And anybody who listens, who has listened and who will listen, will be facing the same thing. So we have to make sure that the charge is very clear. God doesn't waste time because he's a steward of life and because he is he says I know what I poured into you it was not a coincidence I knew the exact time that it was coming so this this is your rhema your right now word to say for your current situation that he is saying it's time for you to make a shift it is it's time for you to make a shift not to be praying about it you're supposed to be acting it out so i'm about to ask we're taking a little bit more time is there something you've heard today that you do not understand because we don't want anybody to leave and say i didn't quite get that because we want you to be fully accountable when you leave from here it's totally accountable is there something you've heard today that wasn't clear that you can't tell somebody else So are you saying by silence? Because I don't know what silence means. Is there something you've heard that's not clear? So two people said something. Is there something you heard that's not clear? No. Now about seven or eight said something. Let's try this again. Is there something you've heard that isn't clear? Not clear. So I just want to ask, is there permission to ask a question, though? Because you kind of actually led to what I was contemplating asking, but I was just going to wait. No, no, go on to the question. All right, so <clears throat> what do you believe in scripturally, biblically, is the penalty or the consequence for the unwillingness to be compliant with Yahweh and not use what he has placed in your hand? Oh, it's Particularly when it comes to gifts or whatever that's been bestowed along with this, too. Oh, it's pretty simple in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, God has a discipline program that he puts in place. In fact, I mean, just it's good that you did that. I mean, just we just read what he says. He has a discipline program, just like in an employee's handbook, when they say what consequences are, there's a discipline that he says needs to take place when his children don't do. He says, I, I'm going to do something. Um, Starting at verse 5 in Hebrews 12, it says, My son or my daughter, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or faint when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every child whom he receives. This is what his word says. 
endure it as discipline because God is dealing with you as sons and daughters for what son is there that doesn't have a father that disciplines them. And if you are without discipline, which all of his children receive, then you would have to consider yourself to be an illegitimate child or a bastard. Furthermore, it says we have earthly fathers who discipline us and we learn how to respect them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? Verse 10, for the discipline is for a short time, but it has a benefit. Verse 11, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it will yield the fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by the discipline. Oh, there is a consequence. He will alter your trajectory. He will alter your life when you choose to not do something. There will be consequences. And you may try to say it's because of what somebody else did or said, but God's hand has frozen your circumstances. When he gives you something and you don't act on it, then he freezes it and says, oh, you'll never get past this. Don't bother to ask me about that because I just spoke to you. You had it in your hand and you didn't act on it. And he says, as a result, that's what's going to happen. He said, that's what's going to happen. We know how to honor and follow direction, especially when we're getting paid. We learn those handbooks up and down, back and forth, and know what to do because we don't want we don't want to be on a pip. We don't want to be on a performance improvement plan. We follow it to the letter, so we know how, and God knows we know how, and so that's why He says, "Oh, you will honor that more than me," and you think I'm going to let you off the hook? And they did not let you off the hook, and you submitted to that, and I'm the one who's the source of the air that you breathe. So do you believe that they can discipline you better than me? It's what he really is. And you think they can discipline you better and more severe than me? He said, I know how to shut you down. I know how to put you on your back. I know how to change everything. I know how to get you fired if you have a job. And you may say, they, I didn't do anything wrong. But God knows how to squeeze you out of stuff. He'll cut, he will compromise your finances. He will, he will modify your circumstances. He will do all of that because he says, you did not do what I showed you to do. You did not do it. And I promise you, I could tell you story after story after story about me. But he only had to do it one good time. One good time. One good time. You know, and you kind of heard me talk about that one good time he did. He said, I'm going to show you that everything you thought you learned is worthless. All your intellectual capacity and the properties that you've gotten and the degrees that you earn, it will not earn you a thing. And I'm going to show you that people want to hire you and they can't hire you. I'm going to show you something that you ain't that what you thought because they said it. I'm going to show you because you did not do what I told you to do. So I'm going to I'm going to make you pay. And you, you can't get out of it until he says, I think you learned your lesson. Then he'll take, take the pressure off. Did you know there are some people in the hospital right now, when they finally say yes to the Lord, he'll let them out of the hospital. He'll let them out. All of a sudden, their, their vitals, everything changes because they forgave somebody. They stopped being mad at somebody. All of a sudden, their system shifted. Let me tell you this last thing, and I'm so glad that Natasha started this. Now, I kind of get this. There are some exaggerated circumstances. We were not, we're not supposed to be here this long, but we do need to be here this long. There are some exaggerated circumstances and challenges in life that are prolonged because of disobedience. There are some health-related things that don't progress because we are not right with people. And the channel to God is compromised because we don't treat people right. And he says, I'm going to stick you right here. And every time the doctor looks at something, it's going to look the same or worse. Because you don't treat people right. And I told you, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and your neighbor as yourself, that all the commandments hang on this based on Matthew 22. He says, when you're not right with people, you're not right with me. 
and I'm going to compromise. I'm going to let your life be compromised. In fact, I'm going to hold back some stuff I want for you because you're not ready for it because your attitude is off. Because you can't get along with people. You don't prefer other people. You don't serve other people. You're looking at your stuff and making it the most important thing in your life instead of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I'm who you should be focusing on in spite of anything. Did you know that if you're missing something, God can get it to you right now? Like right now? Just like right now. But how do you get along with people? How are you treating people? How are you treating people? Do people want to see you around or they hope you don't show up? And he says, you're not representing me. You want me to bless you and you misrepresent me? And you want me to shower you with blessings because you sing a praise song over here and you read a few passages of scripture? And your actions don't match anything that you said. You hallelujah to the king of king and then reading the word. And he said, you want me to bless that? You're a fraud. Those are the consequences for not acting out when you've been poured into. Those are the, there's a price to pay. There is a price to pay. So it's like. You know, my granddad in terms, you know, this is Ebonics to the hilt here. He would say, get to getting it. <laughs> in other words, what he really <laughs> what he really was saying is do what you know to do and do it now and do it now. And do it now. The worst thing I wanted to hear from my parents and grandparents, I'm not going to tell you anymore. Oh, it was over then. It, it, oh, it was over then. Because there's no, there's no coming back from that. When they say, I'm not going to tell you anymore, you are in trouble. Now, God is saying, if I told you once about something, you haven't done it. I'm not going to tell you again. I'm going to charge you with it. And you're going to be sentenced to the school of discipline. And the only way you get out of it is that he's going to break you, break you to a point to where you realize there's nothing you can do until you look up. Because he's going to say, you didn't trust me before I did this, and I'm not going to let it go that easy because you said, have mercy, Lord. He said, I'm not going to have mercy right now. You are in discipline. This is discipline mode. Now, some of us are in the school of discipline right now. And he's saying you can get out, but you're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to humble yourself and make you less important than you are and find somebody else that you want to help blow up instead of trying to blow you up. If you really want what God wants, and I'm stopping right here because this is the last thing he told me. If you really want what God wants in your life, you got to go help somebody else do what he's called them to do. And until you're willing to do that, you may as well stop trying to get anything done. You need to stop trying to get anything done, you know, and I'm start with the ministry team. The reality is if you want God to give you an audience for you to be heard, you all better make it your business to make me the most important man, you know, the most important man, you know, cause what flows from me will get in you. If you honor me to the highest level, not because I need it, but because you need it, but because you need it. And the reason why I say because I honor my pastor and he knows it. You know what I do? I invest in him every month. I don't give to the church that I'm a member of. I give it directly to him. I'm his favorite son in ministry. <laughs> because I honor him. Now, I'm not asking you all to give me anything. Just don't, 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 don't mix that up. Don't mix that up. I'm just saying to you, I live out what I talk about. I live it out. I live it out. You could take a camera and follow me around anywhere all day, all the time. You're going to see this same person all of the time. There is no double walk. There is no double talk. I'm this same guy all of the time, everywhere. And anybody to tell you the same story about me. He's about serving other people, making them better than they are. And he'll do it for nothing. So if I'm living that life, 
What do you think God's going to hold you accountable for? Because you got the living example in front of you. So do you believe that God's going to let anybody connected to here off the hook when he says, I'm showing you a human who's doing what he's saying. So do you believe you get off the hook? No. No. No, that's why y'all need to keep Gwen in prayer because she has to live with me. And she has to deal with all the nuances of, of me not counting money and giving stuff away. And she has to deal with all of that. You all need to pray for her. But at the same time, I take care of her. You follow what I'm saying? I take care of her. She couldn't look as good as she looked if I wasn't taking care of her. She ain't got no stress in her life. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a non-stress entity in her life. You understand that? The reason why she looked the way she does is because she's living, this, she's living a stressless life with a man in her life that don't produce stress. None. Just look at her. Get a good look at her. Just get a good look at her. The evidence is clear. I'm a non-stressor modeling non-stress for men to be able to say, all I got to do is check it out. Now, I'm just saying. Now, I'm just saying. Now, you all have had enough. Now, I'll stop talking because I'm done right now, but it's time for you all to start doing it. Start time to start doing this stuff, you know. Start, start doing start doing this stuff in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And we know in with the name of Jesus. We have the victory in the name of Jesus. And Satan will have to flee. Oh, tell me who can stand for when come that Jesus, Jesus, pressure. We have the, let's just do that one more time. In the name of Jesus. We have in the name in the name Satan Oh, tell me who stand for when call that Jesus. We have the victory.